and the sort of context we're operating in, I mean, there's a lot of recent work being done in terms of uh, various organizations, Action Aid's done quite a bit, Troca's been doing some stuff, some very interesting stuff about coming out of the state in terms of 2020, what does the world look like for NGOs? Uh, this is a recent one that Bob Bond has um, put out about two months ago. Uh, you know, they are highlighting the sort of the big pictures, you know, what is this world that we're operating into? What do the NGOs need to be factoring? There's nothing new here. You know, if you were Coca-Cola, if you were Lazard, you would have very similar sort of analysis, I suspect. You know, the issues around inequality, the issues of climate change. I think it's interesting that urbanization um, was put quite so high up that list. Um, quite clearly, you know, huge issues around urbanization. And we focus traditionally on rural development. But, uh, you know, quite clearly, you know, the urban and the growth of megatowns and you know, as I said, I've just been in Mwanza. Mwanza, when I, you know, 20 years ago, when I first knew it, was a nice, sleepy little provincial town on the edge of Lake Victoria. It's now what, a million and a half, nearly two million people. Um, you know, it's a very isolated in many ways. So this is the sort of thing that we're seeing, and there are similar other pieces of research out there. I don't think there's anything that would be rocket science. I think one of the things that is interesting, and one of the tensions, not just for the NGO community, but for the donor community, is this issue about inequality. Um, if you take a couple of states like Bihar and Orissa um, in India, there are more people in quote unquote abject poverty than there are in the whole of sub-Saharan Africa. So maybe we should be focusing our resources in Bihar and Orissa, and yet India is sending people to Mars. You know, if that's the tension, you go to Mumbai and you see the wealth there. Um, but actually, if you just take the sheer numbers, um, and again, you go to a favela in Brazil or wherever it may be. So there's some really interesting tensions, I think, and to what extent do we as NGOs, do we as donors, still continue to work in middle-income countries? Um, DFID, again, if you look at its, the data where they're putting their money, there's still a considerable amount of money going into India. There's pressure from the Daily Mail and all sorts of people around that. Still a huge amount going into Kenya, and yet in African terms, Kenya will be a middle-income country. So Nigeria would be the same. But there are real issues about inequality. So I think this inequality thing is something that's going to rumble around um, and quite clearly needs to be taken into account. And again, how do you express this? How do you express this to students? What are the images that you use when you're trying to portray um, these challenges? You know, do you use a cartoon? Um, quite clearly in terms of inequality, you know, there are all sorts of ways of portraying it. I mean, the two obscenity that I heard on the news this morning that 432 people own half of Scotland. I mean, quite extraordinary data like that. You know, 80 of the richest people earn whatever it is, 20% of the world's wealth. You know, I mean, there are all sorts of data like that you can come up with. So there are issues like that. Or do you use a sort of a very emotional picture, the sort of thing that gets my kids terribly distressed, the lonely polar bear that's about to die on it, you know, because of the impact of climate change. And so there, I think there's some really interesting issues, and I'm certainly teaching on MBA programs and talking sort of, trying to work with senior people in the UN. How do you actually get people to engage in some of these challenges and what it looks like? And I think one of the dangers is that we can also paint a very gloomy picture. Um, if you look at some of you know, the MDGs and the issues around poverty um, and the way that we present that, um, actually there's been huge success. The numbers of people in poverty um, really have dropped considerably. Um, and you know, all this concern we have on, on children. So, um, very interesting, one of those TED Talks by, um, what's his name, Rasling talking about forget children, they're irrelevant, you know, focus on the old people, focus on the people with dementia, they're the ones who are really suffering. You know, so there's some really interesting tensions about what's going on, but there are some very positive pictures. And again, you need to sort of factor that in, where is it that you focus? And if you want some good data, the Oxford uh, Martin Commission report, that you can download as a PDF, really excellent data. Um, really interesting way of their analysis, and I'd recommend anyone to look at that. Um, of the Oxford Martin Commission, it's um, it from the Futures Department. And that, you know, would be a sort of typical way they present it. Now, you can argue the toss about that debate, you can say, well, it's all to do with growth in China and things like that. But on the whole, 
there are some, there has been some considerable success stories. You know, there are obviously issues in terms of fragile states and poverty, and you see what's happening in Syria and migration, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But as a sort of macro picture, it is a fairly positive one. Um, in terms of what NGOs are having to struggle with, so there's the sort of broader global mega trend issues. But beyond that, the sort of debates that you're hearing in the NGO community particularly, <coughs> is this whole thing about the changing relationship with um, partners in the South, increasing sort of uh, effectiveness of partners in the South, increasing size of them. You look at BRAC um, and the increasing power and more and more donors, increasingly giving money directly to partners. And then you get into this dis debate about disintermediation, you know, that Northern NGOs are intermediaries. And disintermediation is let's go, we don't need them, they're just adding cost. So let's go directly um, to the South. Now, there's been, that's been talked about for you know, 10, 15, 20 years now. Clearly, that is beginning. I mean, USAID is talking about putting 30% of their total NGO spend directly into the South. Now, whether it will happen, the very fact they made that as a policy objective. I'm on the board of a large African NGO. And it's very clear you know, that, that the number of donors that they're getting, the growth in their income, is because of donors coming directly in. So that has consequences for donors and NGOs in the north. What does that mean? What is your role? Um, are you still an intermediary? Are you merely a fundraiser? Are you a broker? Are you a knowledge resource? What does it mean? But it also means as we're looking for new ways of collaborating. And the old weasel word partnership, again, is history. I was very struck talking to a recent NGO that I was working with doing their strategy. They refuse point blank to have the word partnership in their strategy paper. It means nothing to anybody anymore. It's become so devalued as a term. And so people are talking about relationships. Um, the sort of language I'm hearing is much more the language around co-creation and the language of convening, you know, creating space by which people can come together. Co-creation where you're actually working together very much as co creation but the funding is done directly to the South very often. So that has huge implications. Where traditionally the funding is coming to the Northern organization, the funding is the Northern, the Southern organizations are creating with the Northern organ, in the sense they're buying their expertise. So there's some very interesting breaks there. But the word partnership, as I say, I think has been much abused. And increasingly where it is used is back to the old-fashioned term of partnership, where it is a contractual instrumental relationship. I'm very, very clear within that. Clearly the impact of the web, the impact of digital technology. Um, I don't know if any of you went to the Bonn conference um, last year. Very interesting paper by um, Owen Pringle, who had been doing all the digital transformation in Amnesty and saying, yeah, we can put all the bells and whistles in, we can put all the kit, the real cost of getting people to engage in it, to understand how to use it, and what does it mean for the way they work. So it's not just about kit, it's actually the cultural change that goes with digital transformation, and all that means a little bit into the issues of smart working, all of which you know, raises real issues for northern organizations, which in a sense were the gatekeepers, the intermediaries, with the web, with crowdfunding, with all sorts of different, you know, Skype, much easier for people in the South to engage. Clearly, you know, ongoing competition about aid funding. I was in Denmark last week um, with an organization, <coughs> and the whole purpose for me there was to help them think through what happened if the then government lost. They did lose. And this organization's funding, they're pretty certain, will be slashed by at least 40%. You know, you look at AusAid, the white part of AusAid. You look at Canadian Cedar, the white part of Canadian Cedar, and the way that AusAid has got rolled into the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, much more linked with trade, same with Canadian Cedar, linked with trade. So they're also, I mean, we're incredibly fortunate <coughs> in this country to be different. But you know, they're under pressure, staffing pressures, they're becoming more of a wholesaler, they don't necessarily have the staff to deal uh, at a micro level. So there are all sorts of issues around aid funding. So very new interesting players coming in. Um, you look at the Qatar Foundation, you look at the UAE, the UAE gives more than say the Danes are giving at the moment. But the second largest humanitarian donor in the world is which country? 
China? No. Who okay. are the states are the largest? Who are the second largest? Okay. Well, I don't mind that. We're peasants. peasants. <laughs> it's Turkey. You know, and if you look at some of the data on the humanitarian, if you look at the development initiatives data, and the way in a country like Turkey is becoming a player, uh, you look at the number of new embassies they're opening, and the you know, expansion of their airline, etc., etc., etc. The amount of money, obviously Syria has had a big influence on that, but they've made a conscious effort to increase that. So we've got a whole lot of new potential players out there. As you say, we're not sure what the impact of China will be on time. Um, and actually then there's the debate about aid, aid architecture, is it going to survive? Uh, you know, it's, it's sort of rather historical anachron, colonial anachronism, so all sorts of debate about the end of aid. Um, you know, remittance funding is three or four times larger than aid, let alone what foreign direct investment. So where does aid fit into that flow of money from the rich north to the global south? And then clearly shifts in funding models, much more use of contractors by donors, uh, much more use of um, non-traditional groups. We then also got a whole set of debates around uh, new regulatory environments that are affecting NGOs, and you look at some of the new legislation coming out of South Africa, you look at the tax regimes in the form of Soviet Union, etc., etc. Um, and the, the, the reputational risks that go with that, there's the continued pressure on effectiveness and impact, and we may come back to that in a while. I think, you know, has that shot its bolt? Very struck by that National Audit Office report that came out yesterday, really critical of PBR. Um, and actually, PBR is, is counterproductive, it's far too high risk, far too costly. And what will that be? The, you know, whereas PBR, in different terms, is still very much part of the mantra of EFM, et cetera, et cetera. So there'll be some interesting debates around that. And certainly some issues in terms of you know, compliance. And also what we're seeing is a whole range of new business models um, that different NGOs are adopting. Um, you look at things like the, the social franchises, people like Murray Stokes are rolling out, you look at the International Centre of Social Franchising, some very interesting different alternative models coming out there, move to social enterprises, different ways, different structures, um, different business models. So I think what we're seeing, we've got this world out there with concern of climate change, population growth, <coughs> resource shortage, urbanisation. We've also got a world within the NGO sector, which is concerned about their own you know, their own funding base, their, their relationship with the South, what is their role, very crudely. And that's where I want to fit into this sort of discussion in terms of what we're looking at, what is their role.